Um, I'm Gail Boyle, I'm Senior Curator of Archaeology at Bristol Museum and this is Kate Isles who works with me at Bristol Museum. We are both museum archaeologists um, and we work with one of the largest archaeological collections in the southwest. Um, we're from uh, Bristol Museum, um, you can see that on the top left just there, it's not the tall tower, it is the shorter museum looking building on site. Um, Bristol Museum is a major partner museum. Uh, it's funded partly by Arts Council England, but essentially we are a local authority provided service. Um, I put these three slides together to start off with because uh, even though we're the largest collection in the southwest and the longest lived probably, uh, we don't have a permanent archaeology display. Um, there are a number of reasons. You can talk to me about those over lunchtime if you want to. Um, but that makes our lives quite interesting in terms of using the archaeological collections for teaching and learning. Um, because there's not an awful lot to work with in the gallery, we are able to use our collections in different ways. Um, both myself and Kate have a lot of experience of working with all different ages in terms of engaging people with archaeology, right down from infant school up to U3A or older um, who come to us. But this morning we're going to largely talk about what we've been doing with primary schools. Um, and if you want to talk about the other stuff again, you can speak to me at lunchtime. In terms of what we do have on display, there are very few items in Bristol Museum and Art Gallery. We do also curate a Roman villa site, which you can see a picture of just there. Um, clearly, we can use that for learning outside of the classroom. Um, we do lots of activities on sites. Um, and we've also got about 350 objects on display spread over three galleries of Bristol's newest museum, M Shed. Um, which is on the harbour side, that's a thematic um, museum. So it's about Bristol's place, it's about Bristol's people, it's about where people live and how they interact with each other. And we managed to sneak 350 items of archaeology into all of those themes. Um, clearly, there was a major shift in terms of what was the national curriculum. I should add that I've been a school governor, I did understand the curriculum as it was, I understood the requirements of the curriculum, I did lots of work with an after-school archaeology club within um, a primary school setting. And we used some of that experience to understand what position primary school teachers might find themselves in if they were suddenly faced with a major change, including, for example, and that was very dear to my heart, the prehistoric period, because that's clearly my most favourite um, period of archaeology. And suddenly there were huge numbers of teachers who had never faced teaching a class uh, anything to do with prehistoric material. Um, and so the first, we sat down with our learning team, and our learning team at that time consisted of two full-time um, teachers, if you like, based in the museum. Neither of those people had any archaeological expertise. They'd worked with archaeological material. Um, and so we went into partnership with Children and Young People's <coughs> Services in Bristol City Council, the Trading with Schools offer, and we started to work out what we could offer in terms of continuing professional development for teachers. And in the first instance, we attacked the prehistoric period and what we could do. And, and then we started working through different periods. And obviously, um, we've done work on Roman Bristol too. It was very clear that we needed to produce a whole new raft of resources. And both myself and Kate were involved with those um, resources. As part of a CPD day, uh, we also needed to understand what the primary school teachers themselves understood about archaeology. So, as with all archaeologists, we like a good timeline. We've seen one this morning, which is 10 metres long. Uh, we actually got the teachers to make the timeline. So we provided a random set of, seemingly random set of photographs of sites and objects and dates. Um, and we asked them to put them into a line. <coughs> So we asked them to, to think about what they, they would actually create in terms of a timeline. And then clearly we took them through about 500,000 years worth of prehistory using objects for handling and me standing up and talking about the different features. And then we asked them to revisit the timeline to see whether their, um, their own learning, their own thinking had changed and it had changed quite a lot. These are just some of the examples of the resources that we um, used to wayfind the prehistoric period. So we provide an image bank and we provide notes. We have something in Bristol uh, museums which we call ABC, it's a Bristol curriculum. Everything we do is, is very much rooted in local learning, local sites, local material, um, things where the children actually live. Um, and so we put 
a, a variety of objects together. They're all available to use. Um, they're all different kinds of resources. So there are paper-based resources that I've created, um, but we also point them in the direction of, of, of pre-existing resources. So we're not going to waste our time reinventing the wheel when it's already been invented by somebody else. So we will actually, as I said this morning, go through a variety of online sources and then actually validate them. We've also got a lot of archaeological sites um, relatively close to Bristol Museum. So this one, most people in Bristol don't actually realise that the uh, one side of Clifton Suspension Bridge um, goes from Clifton Hillfort, so Clifton Camp Hillfort. Um, so I did some experimental work with a primary school and took two classes full of children there and started to develop what we might do in terms of an on-site assisted visit. We do offer our <coughs> services to schools to, to accompany them with the visit, so you can actually buy our time as an expert if you like. But we also wanted to enable teachers to do that for themselves. So everything that we have produced is replicable either by the teacher or by another member of staff. So it, it, clearly, Kate and I cannot spend all of our time out <coughs> in the field um, with schools because we have a whole collection and other museum responsibilities. So we have tried to replicate what we do for other people and we've tested them. One of the things that we do inside the museum, um, there was no sort of offer in terms of engaging with the prehistoric period in the museum. Um, and so I sat down with one of the learning offer officers and uh, she actually took a lot of notes. This is what they look like. And this turned into, believe it or not, a five page document. Um, this was an inquiry based um, session. It was all about looking at objects and getting the children to ask questions about objects, collecting those questions and then going through a guided handling session, looking but not touching to start off with and then touching and then revisiting the questions. Um, we use a lot of freelance teachers in the museum as well, so they need to be able to replicate this information. So they've taken my experience of being able to use and handle objects um, with primary school children, and we've replicated it. And we produce documents like this, um, which take them through the whole visit, what they should be doing. And if they need that to be reinforced by me, um, then I will sit down and I will spend time doing that with them. in the gallery. So um, I called this talk Bronze Age Fancy Footwork largely because this is my most favourite object that we have in the museum. Um, it's a slab from a kist um, which was originally underneath a barrow at Pool Farm in Somerset and as you can see it has been carved with feet. Um, there is only one other example in the whole country of a piece of um, stonework of the prehistoric period um, that's carved with feet and that's um, from the Coldsdale Stones. Um, it's a great big feature in one of our galleries, which invites people to think about what this object might mean to them if they knew nothing about it. I've done an exercise with children, an inquiry-based exercise, which starts off with, in a similar fashion to Chris. He talked about giving them a few facts and then letting them run with. So I would tell them about it being part of a burial. I'd tell them about the cremations underneath it. I'd tell them that it was made during the Bronze Age. And then I would ask them what they wanted to know the, the answers to. What are the questions you want to know the answers to? So some of them would say, it was made during the Bronze Age. Why is it made of stone? Um, and so that then leads into a discussion about what the Bronze Age actually means. Um, and one of them said to me, why are there feet and no hands? Um, and so you can start then talking about the, uh, the imagery that's on the stonework. And the second part of the exercise is, so now you tell me why you think the feet have been carved on the stone. And this is a, an exercise in developing deeper philosophical thinking skills. So some children turned around and told me that this, these feet were representative of a family because they took them literally, that the small, medium and large size represented a child, a mother and a father. One girl, though, decided that she decided that this was a prehistoric dance mat. <laughs> that was the same reaction from the class. This is a prehistoric dance mat. And I looked at her and I said, do you know what? There isn't a single expert who has written about this stone in any form whatsoever, deciding that the way these feet are placed might represent how you might need to place your feet for some kind of ritual movement, for a dance, to give you power, for whatever reason. But nobody's talked about them as a physical movement. They've talked about them being representative of this, the journey from this life to the next, but they've never come up with that. And that made you the expert in that particular um, format. So 
That was her Bronze Age fancy footwork. <coughs> I'm going to hand over to Kate now because she's going to tell you about the other aspects of the things that we've been doing to engage with schools. Hi, so as Gail said, uh, we do lots with schools. We don't just wait for schools to come into us, we also go out into schools. So in about six minutes, I'm going to give you a recap of three very exhausting months of my life where we ran three uh, projects concurrently. And the first one uh, was to run an after-school club. We were approached by an inner-city primary school in Bristol um, to run an after-school club to help them deliver some of the national curriculum. Um, so we devised a six-week program for 12 year five to six children and then were asked back to run six more. The kind of sessions we covered, we really wanted to get them uh, introduced to archaeology generally. So we started with this introductory session where we gave, played a game of archaeology or not um, and it was showing them kind of key images and it was really to reinforce the idea, kind of break it kind of gently with a little more force towards the end that at no point were we going to talk about dinosaurs. So it was kind of devastating news to some, but once we got over that, uh, we then looked at a modern, modern rubbish bin to see what um, you could tell from a modern family. We then looked to see how long the materials might take uh, to rot away and did a kind of timeline of modern rubbish. And then we revisited the same rubbish bin to see what you might be able to tell about the same family in a thousand years. Um, a couple of sessions were on archaeology detectives. Uh, we did the obligatory mock excavation, um, but based on King's Western Roman Villa, which is a site that you saw in one of Gail's earlier slides. Um, and it was based on excavation done in the 1950s, also by school children. And that's what this picture shows, the kind of kids in hat with spades, terrifyingly digging hypocords. Um, we were very keen to promote the idea that archaeology wasn't just digging. Um, so we did things on stratigraphy and dating and Gail created a very snazzy Bristol City shirt uh, timeline for them to learn about typology. Um, and we did a lot of kind of map reading exercises using, using OS maps. Um, we took finds into school to do find sessions um, on finds, but also on treasure. So we did a lot of handling, we did drawing, we did finds photography, we did recording and we even did a mini coroner's report. Um, we did burial archaeology um, and the teacher was keen that we brought in some kind of Anglo-Saxon element. Um, at Bristol we don't have many Anglo-Saxon finds and we certainly don't have many Anglo-Saxon finds that we're going to take uh, out of the museum. So we did a mock excavation of an Anglo-Saxon burial to get that across um, and to learn about what burial can tell us. And we did timelines and again the teacher was very keen to stress that she felt that her students had no idea of chronology and we, that really needed reinforcing. So obviously that tackled a huge amount of, um, of national curriculum aims and objectives. Um, it obviously tackled the history curriculum. They learned about chronology, it reinforced lessons on Romans, Anglo-Saxons, prehistory, and it also demonstrated that history comes from a range of sources, so it's not just the, the text that archaeology plays a role. Um, it involved a lot of language and literacy. Every session involved debate, it involved mini presentations, um, lots of it involved writing uh, and writing fines reports um, and it encouraged kind of a wide vocabulary which is part of the language and literary uh, curriculum and we even got them to create their own mini archaeological dictionaries which proved a lot more popular than I thought. Um, we looked at maths, we did uh, 2D drawings, we uh, uh, recorded things on coordinates, we did art and design with, ver with various drawing skills. We learned about objects, so that was design and technology, how objects change over time and through history. We did geography with our map reading, we did um, grid recording, and we studied OS keys. Um, so it's a huge amount. And even though it was after school, uh, and it wasn't really our aim to meet the national curriculum, it, it obviously crept in. Uh, and these are just some of the resources we created. It was a really labour intensive process for us as a museum. We didn't invent all of the resources, but we probably adapted everything. We used young archaeologists resources that we host at Bristol. We used resources from the PAS, from a wide range uh, <coughs> of sources, but we did kind of formulate them into our own design. So we created lesson plans, we created information sheets to give the children, we created <coughs> activity sheets for children and for teachers. Um, a whole host of things that uh, we can use again. 
everything was designed so that next time the teacher could run it herself in class and we could share these resources later. So everything was designed to be sustainable and to have uh, kind of resources if you didn't have the objects themselves. So for the mock excavation, we used materials from pet shops. So we used straw, bird seed and hamster. And I honestly thought that would make it less messy. It just made it a different color mess. <laughs> um, we did cress mark, cross, uh, we grew um, cress over crop marks to show about aerial photography. We got everything um, from a garden center. And the Anglo-Saxon burial, because we didn't have the objects, we just printed out objects. We found an online kind of printable skeleton and then we covered it with them. Um, shredded confidential Bristol Council uh, paper <laughs> to peel back the layers. Um, so it was a huge amount of uh, work, but we've now got these resources to keep. Um, and then this is the teacher using some of those resources actually in her history lessons in school. And this is some of the feedback from the students. Um, <coughs> Malik was really keen to become an archeologist. Um, he even said he learnt some shocking facts. I have no idea what I told him. <laughs> um, but um, the kids had a really good time. The teacher had a really positive experience. But obviously, as I mentioned, it was a completely unsustainable model. I couldn't go back and do that for every school in Bristol. So they wanted us to come back and do more. At the same time, we were getting lots of requests from other schools to go into school rather than coming here. So we met with our learning team and they were very keen um, that we didn't in any way impede the offer that they run of getting kids into the museum. Um, so we had to kind of come up with a compromise. They were also really keen that we didn't run something just for one school. Whatever we had to offer, we had to be able to offer it to all of the schools in Bristol so that it was equal. So we came up with something called these Archaeology Super Days, where three uh, museum staff would go into one school and deliver a whole day of activities, either archaeology uh, through time, focusing on certain periods, or archaeology in practice, focusing, focusing on kind of uh, archaeological techniques. Um, we ran a trial at Ashton Gate Primary School. Um, we reused all of the sessions that we'd used in archaeology after club. Um, so we did a bit of field walking of the floor, looking at a, a we miraculously found a Roman villa. Uh, we took some Roman finds in to do f uh, fabulous finds, and we did a bit of skeleton recording. And that's us in action and then the final project that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute um, is to show that not only do we go in and kind of react to schools requests we also sometimes initiate projects with primary schools to generate content or generate interpretation for the museum itself um, and this is what this project was about um, we got money from the worshipful company, worshipful of, company of Dyers, of Dyers um, who wanted uh, to fund a project on cloth. Um, medieval Bristol uh, made a huge amount of wealth from medieval cloth and it's really important, but we obviously have very few objects that can tell that story. We've got a few baling seals and we've got these rather lovely illustrations of a window, a stained glass window showing St. Catherine and a weaver from a weaver's chapel in Temple Church. But as you can see from the St. Temple Church uh, after the Blitz, they do not survive. So we got money to work with the school to generate a project where we would work with an artist and a primary school to create windows, modern stained glass windows, inspired by the cloth industry and these lost windows from Temple Church. And we chose to work with Elmfield School for Deaf Children um, because we had no real links with the deaf community in Bristol and our access officer felt that we wanted interpretation geared towards deaf visitors to M Shed um, and they were very happy to oblige. So we did lots of different things. This is why it was quite so exhausting. Uh, on the first day, we focused on learning about the history of glass making. So uh, the students visited Emshed. We had a handling session. We then visited the cathedral and got a cathedral tour to see original stained glass windows still in situ. Um, uh, and then we went to Temple Church and had a tour with English Heritage who managed the site. We very conveniently bumped into the mayor who was on his lunch break and then came back and kind of uh, opened the project when it was finished. On the second session, we went out uh, into the artistic world to uh, see how glass was made. We went to Bristol Blue Glass. The kids had a go at blowing glass and made a glass ball ball to take home. And then we went to a creative glass guild to watch modern stained glass being made and to visit their shop to see what kind of uh, products were available for them to choose to design this own window. 
Um, the next part of the project was in school itself, led by the artist Dora, <coughs> um, and they did lots of research onto medieval stained glass windows. They had a go at weaving, some of them loved it, lots of them hated it. They had a go at kind of painting, um, they had a go at glass cutting, testing all risk assessments, cutting their fingers. Um, and at the end of the project, we had really hoped that they would come up with a design that the stained glass window could just take away and replicate. Um, but it soon became apparent that with the various learning needs of this group, um, that wasn't going to happen. So we sat everyone down for a little discussion on what they would like a window to look like. Um, after five weeks of being with them, they all agreed that they wanted it to be see-through. Um, <laughs> and the artists and I looked like we might sob, but after a little while, they also said they would like the Leaning Tower of Temple Church um, on fire or, or blaze in one corner. They'd like something round to represent St Catherine, like a Cath St Catherine's wheel, um, and they wanted the colour blue strongly present to represent Bristol blue glass. Um, and the artist was very talented, took it away, and this is what she came up with. Um, so you can see the children's handprints representing not only them, but also the sign language that some of them use, the warp and the weft of the cloth. Uh, the whole circle is a Catherine's wheel, but with a central Catherine's wheel kind of spinning out to represent the fireworks, which they were very keen on. In the far corner, you can see the Leaning Tower of Temple Church um, and a woad plant to represent medieval dying. So we learned a huge amount from this project. Uh, we learned a lot about working with the deaf community and the various um, things that we would never have thought of without kind of having it in practice, how long it takes for a, an interpreter to translate what you're saying and the kind of pace that you can gear things at. But it was really an amazing experience um, and a great way to get interpretation into the museum for other people to look at and to share. Conscious of time, so hand. Um, just to finish with our top tip is whatever we have done, we have tried to replicate. Um, we will always reuse and reuse and reuse. Um, and as archaeologists who work with the collections and in museums, I think the most difficult part for us was producing these kinds of documents. And we wouldn't have been able to produce these kinds of documents if we hadn't worked in close collaboration with teachers and with our learning staff. Um, so that's my top tip. Uh, communicate and work with the schools and work with the teachers. Thank you.